Before we dive in, the topic for this new What Games Teach Us was suggested by a very kind viewer of the channel, so big thanks to Tumble Ash for sharing his idea. And don't forget that if you too have a suggestion for a game or a topic I could discuss in a future WGTU, you can leave a comment down below, message me on Twitter or send me an email. It's always great to exchange with the community and I think it's really cool we can build this series together, so feel free to share your thoughts. And also, just a little warning, there are going to be some spoilers in this episode, so if you haven't had the chance to discover the Portal games for yourself yet, go and play before you watch it. Anyway, with all that said, today I want to talk a bit about world building in games. Now, let's start with an important clarification. I don't want to discuss games about world building here. So even if they are great games, I won't be talking of Spore, SimCity or Black and White, for example, where the players are asked to mix various space components to create their own microcosm. Instead, here I want to discuss world building as this fundamental block in narration. This idea of imagining characters, locations, dynasties, laws, organizations, and so on, all that is needed to get an understanding of what universe you're evolving in as a newcomer. No matter the medium you're using, be it a film, a TV series, a video game, or a book, this concept of world building is at the heart of the making of a good story, and it's necessary to creating an engaging fiction. Basically, it's what makes you believe in the story that you're presented with, because you feel like it's anchored to a reality. It doesn't have to be a reality like our own, it can be a fairy tale in a land far, far away, but it has to be a reality that could exist. And that's why any fictional world has to have internal consistency. It's not that you have to pretend dragons and fairies exist and could get out of a taxi before your eyes. We obviously know that sorcerers aren't a real thing, so the point is not to ground them in our reality. But the reason series like Harry Potter, for example, work is because they are built on a set of rules. So there's an internal logic to the world of sorcerers. There are things that they can and can't do. For example, we have all this stuff about magic being banned from the Muggles world, and you can only cast spells while you're at Hogwarts. So Harry remains stuck with the Dursleys, powerless, even after he started learning magic. And it makes sense, it's logical, because we've established the right rules before. Take another example, like an old Looney Tune episode. At that precise point where Coyote is falling from the cliff, there is no reason why he should stay in the air instead of diving directly, except for the comedy part. And that's just it. We are okay with this impossible gravity, these too long jumps, these unnatural timings in tunes or animes, because they convey an entire aesthetic with its own rules. And so we accept and enjoy these deviations from reality in this specific context. This idea of going along with the craziness, as long as it's consistent, is what we call the suspension of disbelief. It's the key to letting people enter those magical and over-the-top worlds, and it's also essential to keeping them in. The funny thing is that it's actually true of lots of universes, even the ones that seem more realistic at first. So, let's talk a bit about the Portal series of video games. You've probably heard of those amazing puzzle games, developed by Valve and released in 2007 and 2011, in which you control a silent protagonist, Shell, and have her solve a series of puzzles thanks to a portal gun that allows you to teleport across the rooms by walking through portals. Both games are great, and they mix incredible gameplay with a clever learning curve, dark and acid humor via GLaDOS, and, of course, superb storytelling and world building. In Portal, you're a test subject who has to follow the instructions of the fascinating AI GLaDOS. You get through a series of rooms, and you progress in the Aperture Science Complex, gradually learning more about this strange place that was founded by a somewhat madman, and basically all went to hell on the bring your daughter to work day the moment GLaDOS was turned on. There is no long introduction with the scrolling text, or mandatory NPC discussions that you have to sit through to learn about the lore. Rather, 
Portal relies a lot on implicit storytelling and subtle lore clues to slowly teach you about this world. So, as you learn more about the gameplay mechanics and you unlock more complex puzzle rooms, you also hear GLaDOS share with you little snippets of info about the complex. Because, in spite of all her mockery and heavy thoughts towards you, she's also the only voice and character around you besides your own invisible and silent avatar. But in my opinion, even if the test rooms are great from a player's perspective, it's the other unexpected zones that are the most interesting in terms of narration. Think of the maintenance areas and the offices in Portal, or the old Aperture Complex in Portal 2, where you find all these recordings of Cave Johnson, and you gradually discover the dark past of Aperture, its creator, and even GLaDOS. At first, it's just a bunch of funny stories about how a man tried to earn back some money with crazy projects and moon mining. Still, the whole story turns grimmer and grimmer as you understand this moon dust that created your portal gun, drove him mad, and ruined the company, leading to this dereliction you see today. All this is a very clever way of preparing the climax, and it uses the technique of foreshadowing. By sprinkling about little hints and bits of knowledge, you sort of condition the players to make connections and associate various concepts, like the portals and the moon. So, in the final fight against Whitley, when the roof crumbles and you see the moon, there's sort of a light bulb that goes on in your brain and all your past experience as a portal player merges into one single idea. This round and white thing is at the center of the story, and I absolutely need to put a portal on it. Also, just as a final note, the fact that the story of Portal makes sense across the two games and that it actually takes place in the same universe as Valve's other series, Half-Life, is, to me, a proof that this world is well built, since it's consistent enough to work in multiple episodes and even in multiple series. Of course, Valve also continued this with their brilliant idea of creating ads and additional videos or content to promote their Portal series, so the game is now somewhat in between this fictional reality and our own world. So, what if Portal, in addition to its unique gameplay and its incredible puzzles, was also a great example of good world building? And please tell me in the comments, do you think it's true? Do you think that the cake is a lie? I really hope you enjoyed this video, and actually there's plenty more I wish to say about Portal, so I might do another episode on this game. But in the meantime, don't forget that you can like and share the video if you liked it, and you can also turn on the notifications to not miss the next ones. And of course, if you have any other idea of games that tell us something without us noticing, go ahead and tell us in the comments. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and stay tuned for the rest of this series.